Hello, and thank you for joining us for the second episode in our Board Performance Case Study Series. Hi, I'm Professor Yvonne Kafik, and in this episode of the Board Checkup, I speak with Chief Development Officer of Cornerstones of Care, Dr. Chad Harris. And Chad shares his experience helping the boards he's been associated with both grow in leadership and governance through the practice of board performance assessment. I think you're going to find Chad's approach to the practice both holistic and the process helpful, especially for boards who are going through a merger and rethinking their leadership and governance arrangements. I also think it will be of interest to consultants and leaders on the board who are charged with coordinating the practice in ways that both optimize board engagement as well as learning and development. Following the interview, I reflect on the lessons I learned from Chad's experience with the process and from his use of the board checkup. I conclude with a summary of the elements that make this case another great board love story. Good afternoon. Well, welcome. We have Chad Harris with us today, and we are here talking about the efficacy and impact of board performance assessment through the board checkup. And um, the purpose of of the this interview is really to share the experiences that boards have had and those who have facilitated performance assessment with other boards. So welcome, Chad. Thank you, Yvonne. It's great to be with you. Great. Now, Chad, you've done um, use the checkup on multiple occasions. I'm wondering if, first of all, if you could tell, um, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your roles and the context in which you've assessed performance. Uh, Abs- use the board checkup. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to do so. So uh, I'm Chad Harris. I'm based in Kansas City, Missouri. And currently, professionally, I serve as the chief development officer. Uh, so a fundraising role with an agency called Cornerstones of Care. And um, I've used the assessment with our board of directors uh, at Cornerstones of Care. So in my professional role as a member of the executive leadership team, um, in a prior professional role, I served for a decade for a fraternal organization, uh, Farmhouse Fraternity. And when I was the executive director there, we used the assessment also. And that's when I think you and I first came to know each other probably six or seven years ago. And then um, I also do uh, a little bit of support in the community with other nonprofits and have had the chance to, um, in just in the last year, use the assessment with a few other boards uh, with their assessment efforts as well. Wonderful. Well, tell us a little bit about these organizations and what really was the motivation for wanting uh, to assess performance. Yeah, so um, part is um, one, my own just genuine interest in the topic and and uh, I've uh, uh, done academic work in, in the nonprofit leadership realm. And so uh, that was probably the impetus which started a lot of my uh, professional interest in this as well. Uh, understanding research behind good governance and, and professional practices. Um, and so that's what really drove the start of some of this effort uh, with uh, when I was with the fraternity. Uh, It was going through kind of a a strong growth area and and growth period of time. Uh, And so we decided that uh, before we kind of embarked on the next strategic plan of the board and the uh, organization, uh, we needed to kind of just figure out where we were at. And that positive experience to to reinforce and and celebrate the things that we knew we were doing well. Um, But it also brought to light some areas that maybe needed some improvement. And that inaugural experience with the assessment has really informed a lot of the other work that I've done with using the assessment and utilizing it because um, I've often heard boards or nonprofits say, well, we, we think we need to do this, this, and this. 
And uh, I've kind of said, well, well, what's telling you that, you know? And um, so kind of doing that baseline check is, is a good starting point, I think. And, and that's really been the position that I've uh, started to utilize the assessment with a lot of these different organizations in a professional role, as well as, uh, as kind of a consulting role. Great. Well, can you tell us a little bit about some of the boards then, um, some of the challenges that they were experiencing and, um, and what your experience was with um, helping them through those using an assessment like the checkup? Yeah, so I, I think uh, the best example is is my current professional role with Cornerstones of Care. So um, Cornerstones of Care itself was founded in the, uh, the late 1990s as a child serving agency. And um, shortly into its tenure started to establish some collaborative relationships with other similar mission focused organizations that serve children and families in the mental and behavior health realm uh, in the Kansas City area. And over time, there started to be um, this understanding that there was um, opportunity for collaboration when it came to operations. And so there was almost a consortium that was formed of five different nonprofits that had similar missions that shared some administrative functions and duties. So HR and technology and finance and, and marketing um, were kind of handled centrally through Cornerstones of Care. Um, and these other organizations um, had been maybe more um, historically traditional um, child welfare organizations, uh, the oldest dating back to 1870 when it was the first children's, children's home of Kansas City, kind of, you know, the traditional orphanage model. And, and that work has evolved over time, obviously. And as that collaboration just continued to grow, there was a realization that there was more efficiencies in that uniform, singular, you know, focus. Focus. So um, in 2017, those five organizations legally merged into one organization uh, and, and became essentially part of Cornerstones of Care. So um, going forward, when I joined the agency in the start of 2018, um, we were kind of in our infancy stage. While we had merged legally on paper, uh, there were still some culture that needed to evolve. Um, each board worked a little differently and, and people were still kind of coming to the board role as if they were representing that individual agency rather than looking out for the whole and um, not in a negative way, but there was a bit of kind of, uh, I, I'm here occupying this seat on behalf of, and mm -hmm. there was, you know, some territorialism. Um, so we really kind of needed to start to move beyond that. And um, the basis for doing that was to think about, well, rather than just kind of having a mashup of, of governance from these different five different organizations, let's identify a governance model that, that we support and that we want to identify with going forward. And that's really where your work and the board checkup came in to start to help uh, remind the board of their governance role, what that meant. Um, and so it really started first with kind of a general orientation. Uh, we weren't, we hadn't been in the practice of doing a board orientation uh, as board members came on or our council members um, and as part of that, use the nine dimensions as a framework to talk about that, um, you know, covering the, the legal duties of boards and, and kind of, you know, went, went back to board development 101 almost in terms of its governance role. And I think there are a lot of light bulbs that went on for a lot of board members that maybe had served on boards, but didn't always understand their role <laughs> in serving on a board. And, um, and then as part of that said, let's also kind of do a foundational baseline of where we're at. And so we had a board president at the time who was really supportive of this effort and, and of my own, um, you know, academic interest in, in this work. Uh, and so that's what started Cornerstones of Care on its board assessment journey. Wonderful. So the impetus really was around the governance model. Yeah. Get everybody clear about their roles and responsibilities. That's so, right. So let's talk a little bit then about this process of, you know, assessing performance, because I read that 
you know, in your very first experience with it with farmhouse, uh, it really was, you knew you wanted to do it, but you didn't really know where to start. So, and, or how to go about it. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, um, uh, with any of the boards that you've worked with, what was the process that you put in place? Yeah. Who coordinated it? Who did you involve? Just a little bit about that. Sure. So um, with Cornerstones of Care, um, we involved uh, both the, the members of our governing board of directors, as well as then the seven members who are uh, members of the staff's um, executive leadership team, as each of those chief staff officers or you know chief chief uh, execs um, have a, a different liaison role with different committees of the board we attend all board meetings so there's a high level of of interaction between the executive leadership team from the staff management side and the governing board so um, the cornerstones of care board is comprised of 15 board members and then those seven uh, executive staff members that that were able to do um, that's one I think uh, benefit of the board self-assessment through board checkup is it allows you to differentiate that role and kind of understand okay what 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 lens are you coming to this work through? Are you coming as a board member or are you coming as a staff member? Um, so uh, I served as the facilitator and, and internally and kind of provided those reassurances to the board that this was anonymous and other than being able to see how many people had had completed it I, I didn't know responses otherwise um, so we kind of you know set that internal deadline and then I kind of have to give an update that okay we got we got th four more people to go we got two more people to go and um, so we, we had a, a high success rate early on and, and I think that's important because that shows a, a level of commitment you know from both the board and the staff to participate um, and that's another thing too I, I as we think ahead um, is you know we, we also took the dedicated time to commit to this to understand that this was not just a one and done assessment that one of the benefits is not only doing an assessment but that you can do it again and that you can see progress against yourself um, granted there might be a few different board members around the table you know the next time we take it um, but that that was that was also a, a, a appealing to the board that they could see, OK, we're not just going to get some results, but we're also going to then have some things that we can work toward. Um, oh, go ahead. No, no. Um, so you mentioned something about that. It was anonymous. How important was that, that it was uh, anonymous, a safe space uh, for reflection? I think um, uh Early in the pro, I, I think I think it's very important um, because, um, especially with cornerstones of care, there's been a few themes that have I think been some continuing emerging themes in, in now having taken it three times over three years, um, and there's one about um, this idea of kind of an in group versus an out group, mm -hmm. and so that that balance of um, our decisions made like by the executive committee and then just brought to the board or is the full board being participatory? And there was some, um, not red flags, but just there was some feedback about that, um, that the, the, the results showed. Um, there was also um, results that showed that the, while it's, things were functioning well on the whole, um, there was not that like esprit de corps that we want and, and that we we include as a selling point in serving on our board is that you're you know collaborating with other members of the community and you're able to network and there's been friendships that have formed from this board service so that idea that we want it to be a collegial experience and that was maybe not happening to the extent that we thought um the um diversity of publics in terms of representation, um, you know, of, of our community, of our sector, of geography, of demographics. Um, we knew we needed to be better at that, but the survey uh, results reinforced that. Um, and then the, the board uh, continuing to kind of find its right footing and its role in fundraising. And so those have been themes that um, have been reoccurring kind of through each of the three times that we've that we've done the assessment. 
were there any surprises that emerged? Um, I don't know if surprises, I think it's more that, that reaffirmation of, um, I, I have a feeling about this and, and let's test that out and see if that's true. And so I think, um, you know, um, acknowledging, you know, the, the board's need to, to have clarity around its fundraising role um, and that, that commitment to being better uh, at the intentionality around board recruitment and ongoing board development um, through, uh, you know, a, a diversification of the board. You know, how, did you notice, um, let's talk about how board, board members themselves and the chair as well, because the chair, uh, there are several items in the assessment that explore uh, chair leadership as well as the your own leadership. So mm -hmm. talk maybe a little bit first about uh, what that was like. And then um, how did board members respond to um, the challenges that surfaced? Yeah, so... Um... The first time, so um, over the course of the three years, we've had two different board chairs. And um, the first time we took the assessment, it was the second year of a board chair. So there was kind of a, a strong relationship between our CEO and that board chair. The next time we took it, it was a new board chair and a new C and, and the CEO was the same, but they were kind of getting to know their relationship a little bit. And I think you could see the results reflect that, that um, certainly, you know, I mean, collaborative, but that, but maybe that needed some attention and that we, we were acknowledging that they were still kind of finding that board chair CEO dance and, you know, who takes right. the lead when and, 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 you know, who, who's going to lead this, this, this turn. Um, and then um, I, and by the third assessment, then we saw that kind of stabilize. So I, it's interesting to kind of see um, the trends also reflect the changes in leadership uh, and the changes in the board chair uh, and their role. Um, I think in both cases, our board chairs took it seriously to also see that um, there were things that they themselves maybe needed to address uh, through their own leadership and that it wasn't just always a collective we when it came to the board that, as you say, there are specific things that the board chair uh, is, is uh, acknowledged uh, you know, or, or assessed on. Right. And how about um, the challenges then uh, with the, with the, uh, within the board itself that surfaced through the assessment? Yeah, so um, we have often um, um, taken, um, we've tracked the, the, the top 10 successes over time, and then the top, uh, well, not top, the, the bottom 10 areas of improvement. And this last time, because we have we've scored very well the, the last time in particular, I kind of had to keep reminding the board like these are not bad, but something has to score lowest. And so even though we're getting the the green metric and the high performing kind of uh, scores on these, these are still the areas that that score the lowest. And so um, I've kind of created a um, a year over year comparison of what of those 10 themes have been reoccurring. So we could say, here are 10 reoccurring strengths or, or, and what we did was most recently I took, here are the things that have appeared at least twice in the strengths category. And here are the things that have occurred at least twice in the areas of improvement category. So we can kind of say, these 10 things are part of our culture. Like we've ingrained those over a three year period. Like this is part of who we are. This is what we do well, but these are areas that we still need to give some time and attention to. Um, following the first assessment um, in terms of, okay, now what, with, what do we do with these results? And, and as the, the checkup uh, uh, guide and, and resources good at saying is determine who's gonna take, who's gonna own this going forward. And so, um, we used that as a time to also establish uh, a new committee for the board, which we call the Governance and Nominations Committee. And so it essentially owns the work of board development. And that uh, not only includes an attention to 
board training and onboarding and governance, but also the recruitment of future board members, um, officer slates, you know, those sorts of things that that just had not existed yet, you know, with the agency since its its merger in 2017. Um, so that's the group that then um, kind of took a deeper dive into the assessment. Um, it's a it's a four person council that then myself and uh, our CEO also sit on, and um, we essentially kind of took those ten areas of improvement and assigned them to okay where where do these best fit like who's who's going to own this and some there was a natural fit when it came to either the executive committee or our fundraising council uh, or our finance council um and and essentially kind of said not that you have to provide the solution but we need you to at least be aware that this is something that that we're working toward and wanting wanting to give some attention to to being intentional to improve upon so providing kind of that structure has been helpful to keep it top of mind um it didn't you know because not all responsibilities can just go to this nominations and governance committee because they don't do finance and they don't do fundraising um so that's where we we found ownership to to be responsible for those areas of improvement okay well what to, can you describe some of the changes that resulted um you, you know you you've talked about a nice structure to um to plan uh did any change result so one of the biggest change was um, the intentionality of having an annual board orientation. Uh, and so that that is something that we've um, re-institutionalized, if you will. Um, previously, we were doing an orientation for new board members, but um, we decided we need, like, it, it's an important enough of a topic that this needs to be an annual thing for the whole board. And okay. so while we do kind of a, an individual welcome with the new board members, we also include um, uh, a session that is uh, the full governing board. Um, we have a charitable foundation that also supports us. And so that board of directors. And then we also invite all the, the community uh, members who serve as volunteers on our councils. So those committees and councils of the board also include at large volunteers that aren't members of the board. So in the end, it ends up being about 30 to 40 people, um, but it kind of gives everybody that here, here's what we're working toward and, and here's what we're committed to this year. And um, we try to have that uh, in quarter one, you know, or as early in, in the start of the new fiscal year as possible, uh, which for us is a calendar year. Um, so, um, we, we have a sidebar, we have an interesting uh, memory around that in that the last time we were able to do that in person was <laughs> March 11th, uh, 2020. And that was essentially the last time our board of directors was together in person. So <laughs> yeah, and any anyone else in the world too. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> okay, well, this is um, really uh, important information that you're sharing. Let, let me go back to you know, you started with the governance model uh -huh. um, and and some motivations around governance and, and you made some changes around that. Can you talk about the impact now that you're seeing on board governance? Uh, what changes in governance have resulted um, and how has that impacted your organization? Um, I think it's been, um, I think it's been good in that I think previously there was a bit of a hybrid model where it was that pseudo working governance board. Um, and now I feel that we are more firmly in that um, the, the board has a true governance role with some doing that still happens around strategy and fundraising. But other than that, it's, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, appropriate fiduciary oversight in terms of budget and, and, you know, finances, but otherwise it's letting 
staff be experts in what our agency is focused on in terms of programmatic, you know, supports for children and families in the mental health and, and um, uh, behavior health sector. Um, and, um, you know, our, and our board understands that, you know, and so um, it, it wasn't that before, but I think there's just a, um, a re-understanding of, yes, this is our role and, and we're doing what we're supposed to be doing as a board rather than kind of getting distracted by other things. What do you think um, you learned through this process or what, what, what were some of the learnings for the board? Mm -hmm. um, I think from my own, so again, you, you kind of know my academic background a little bit. So for me, it's exciting to kind of see research and practice. You know, I mean, I, I, I know what research tells us about what, what good boards should do and what they should, should, you know, characteristics that they exhibit. And it's been neat to see that start to take shape, you know, the, the healthy relationship between the CEO and the board chair, um, you know, that, that trust factor that there's a relationship between the board and the management team. Um, the appropriate balance of attention to strategy and fiduciary oversight that, you know, helps us then make sure that we're putting resources where we need to put resources to achieve our mission. Um, uh, the importance of um, the public's perception of your agency, you know, based on uh, who's on your board or the representation of your board. Um, I think that the, the last area that you know, we, um, from a, from often from a funder's perspective, you know, when you fill out a grant, uh, it's very common for a board to say, you know, share with us the demographics of your board, or, you know, what's, what's the breakdown. And, um, I'm often curious what those funders are then doing with that information in terms of like, well, why does that matter? But, um, at the same time, we're realizing the benefits of, you know, um, a more diverse group of people around the table. Um, for us also, that not only includes kind of the, the traditional gender, you know, racial or ethnic uh, uh, representation, but for us, it's a commitment to um, members of the community that maybe also have a lived experience that is connected to our mission. So individuals who um, have been foster parents, individuals who have adoptive parents, um, individuals who they themselves have been in foster care, um, who have had mental health challenges or experiences or you know, have sought care. Um, and realizing that through that diversity of thought comes maybe not a different outcome, but a better dialogue in that process when we have discussion around strategy or when we have discussion around decision making. Um, so it's been really exciting to kind of um, see that that knowing what we should do, but then also taking the time to help us get there. Wonderful. What advice would you um, give to other boards uh, or other EDs or, or executives considering um, this practice of board performance assessment? Uh, do it. <laughs> I mean, because I, I go back to um, uh, that idea of, of you know, um, lean into that hunch that you may have that like you perceive that this is a strength or you perceive this is a challenge, uh, but dedicate the time and resources to doing an assessment to uh, to to explore that, um, you know, when when time and resources are limited, we can't be all things to all people, and so this helps prioritize where you should give attention, um, and you know, acknowledge and celebrate the successes you're having, but then also start to put a plan in place about how to be a better board in some of those areas that maybe need assessment or need improvement. Um, I think the other aspect is, is um, commit to the process and trust the process. So um, I don't think, I, our, my experience has been with now all the different venues and uh, in which I've used this, um, 
it's not overly time consuming and it's not intended to be overly burdensome, but you do need to have somebody dedicated to lead the process, um, be that internal or external that understands the process. Um, and then you also have a board that is gonna take the time at a meeting to hear the feedback, to understand the results, and then to commit to make a plan to, to have some ownership around how to improve. Um, and I think, you know, the other thing is that the research tells us that that boards that assess themselves end up being higher performing boards anyway. And so um, what's who doesn't want to be on a more high performing board? <laughs> yeah, and I was looking at, at your data as well, and I see that um, across the boards that you've worked with. And um, are there some areas though that you think are more difficult to improve than others and um how do you um you know what advice do you have around taking on some of those really difficult issues yeah um i think um um the one you know around the board composition that's an area that can can probably be a difficult conversation and that may vary also based on the mission of the organization you know is its scope and in geography those sorts of things but at least understanding what composition should look like you know for your board and and having that intentional conversation um, and this gives you the excuse to start that conversation. If you need an ex if you need permission to start that conversation, use the data or use the assessment and or with a, whatever topic it may be, you know, use the results to be the excuse to start to have that difficult conversation where you may need. Um, the other one that I think, you know, could vary based on on a not that not that the dimensions aren't uniform, but um, having done work in the membership association realm as well, when those are, are uh, nonprofits, but not necessarily charitable or, you know, philanthropic driven, the role of fundraising can look different and, and, you know, based on what a funding structure is or that sort of thing. So, you know, just understanding that, that there may be variance in how you interpret your role in fundraising, just based on the, the structure or nature of, of the nonprofit. Wonderful. Well, listen, Chad, thank you so much for sharing your experiences uh, with us on multiple boards and um, your insights into governance and, and your interests certainly shine through and passion for this. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for the opportunity. So what can be learned from Chad's experience with the practice of performance assessment and the use of our online tool, the Board Checkup? Lesson one, the practice of assessing performance was especially helpful for the board of the newly merged organization. Specifically, it helped clarify the new board's role and responsibilities and the work needed to create a new culture around governance in the organization. Lesson two, the practice helped establish baseline checks on board performance. It helped surface issues in need of board change, and it helped inform the process of strategic planning. Lesson three, because the process was anonymous, members felt comfortable assessing their board's performance, as well as giving voice to sensitive issues, particularly those that were not in alignment with the organization's core values. Lesson four, the process of assessing performance resulted in shared ownership for board development across board responsibility and governance practices. Lesson five, over time, the board became more intentional about change and it assigned ownership to a committee like a governance committee that could analyze results bring change recommendations back to the board oversee those efforts and track improvement over time lesson six the practice of board performance assessment helped the board shift 
to a more appropriate governance model, which led to a better understanding of the fiduciary aspects of the board's role while also recognizing the role and responsibilities of staff as experts in what the agency was responsible for. Lesson seven, the bottom line from Chad's interview, commit to the process, dedicate time and engage in it, support the coordinator and trust in the process and use the results generated from it to help prioritize change. And finally, put a plan in place to improve performance. So what about those elements that I think make this a great board love story? Well, passion, the mission of the newly merged organization, and the mission of, of the, the other organizations that Chad's been associated with were really at the heart of the assessment process. The protagonist in Chad really is being a champion on the board for change through performance assessment. And the timing of it was, was really important, particularly for the merger of the organizations that formed cornerstones of care. Suffering, I think the um, assessment helped to surface any underlying challenges that would have been a threat to the newly merged organization. And the match really in, in this case was about use of the assessment to help educate the board and new members um, and using it in a general orientation. Growth, I think the, the case and, and, and Chad's experiences really speak to improve capabilities over time of both the board and staff in leading the organization. And finally, commitment really through through the entire process, trust was developed and there was engagement of, of the board and all stakeholders in it that helped improve the governance process. If you like this podcast, we would appreciate it if you would subscribe, share it with other boards in your network and leave a review, especially if you liked it. Feel free to leave comments and questions about the board in this podcast or boards of directors in general, questions that you would like us to explore in future podcasts. And if you have suggestions for me, please feel free to reach out using the contact information.